G'day and welcome back to the 40 channel. So, very exciting news. Minty has passed engineering. Now I am absolutely stoked with that. Yes, you can see the smile on my face because I have this bit of paper. Mate, we've nailed it. It's engineered, it's ready to go on the road. I am absolutely stoked, yes. But what we're gonna talk about today is the entire build process. So I've had a whole stack of questions over through Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube, just about different little bits and pieces. A lot of private messages, and that's fantastic, but it can be a little bit difficult to try to get back to everyone. So what we're gonna to do today is gonna to go through the whole process. So if you're doing a barra conversion, this would be the video for you guys. All right, so. What we're going to attempt to do is we're going to try to run through all the little bits and pieces, tips and tricks, things that you might need to look out for when you're doing your barrow conversion. Now, number one is that you need to talk to whoever's going to do your engineering because every engineer might have a little bit of a different idea and might be looking for some things a little bit differently. On top of that, each motor will have different characteristics that will require different things for engineering. This is the FG motor. So this is 2012, and this particular motor, when you're buying it, you need to look out for a few things. Right, so let's start from the very beginning. Purchasing your Barra motor. Right, so at the end of the day, you need to purchase whatever Barra you want that's gonna fit your budget. The beauty of this is you can go from $300 to anywhere upwards of five grand if you wanna go a turbo Barra. The first thing you need to do is make sure that whatever barrel you get, regardless whether it's FG or not, you're gonna need an FG sump. And the reason for that is it's gonna give you clearance under your drive axle. The second thing you need to do is when you're buying your barrel motor is that it comes with everything that's attached to it. And I'm talking about everything. And I got caught out here. So when you buy your barrel, you need to make sure that it's coming with all your wiring, your ECU, your accelerator pedal, and on the newer ones, all the little emissions bits and pieces. So vacuum hoses, little solenoid valves, purge tanks, all that stuff that normally gets thrown out when someone's ripping a barrel motor out. Do not throw it away. Right, so we've got optional bolt-ons and this is something you really want to do when the barrel is outside of the vehicle. Now, as you might have seen early on in the piece, the first thing that we did to this barra is we swapped the alternator and the power steering. There's a couple really good reasons for this. One, the barra motor power steering pump is totally renowned for leaking and causing issues right down on the alternator and causing your alternator issues and power steering issues down the track. This comes from Castle Main Rod Shop. It moves our power steering reservoir to anywhere you like. We've got a small little reservoir here. Admittedly, this is just straight from eBay. A great little alloy unit, nicely welded up, all the fittings we needed, and we just made up a little bracket to mount there. The next big thing you really need to work out is air intake. Now, I'm telling you right now, I went through a stack of time and effort to try to work out something that was gonna be a little bit more factory. We looked at original Barra air boxes, we looked at Commodore air boxes, we looked at Subaru air boxes, we looked at other Land Cruiser air boxes, uh, we looked at custom boxes. At the end of the day, without doing some crazy modifications, and there is some beautiful custom boxes out there that sit in this big giant open spot here, we went with the most simple and cheapest solution that I should have went with without wasting two weeks and that'll help you pass engineering. We need to get this barra into your 40. Now in my opinion, and it's not just because I'm wearing McKinnon's hat, there is only really one option and that is the McKinnon's Cruisers bolting kit. Now there is some other kits out there that uh, are made by some other companies but they are very generic and you've still got a little bit of work into making them fit all in nice and neatly. The McKinnon's mount will go straight in but there's a bit of a disclaimer there. So, normally when you're doing any type of a conversion like this, you'll move your steering box so you can have a power steering box from a 60 series. That way you've got a bit of luxury as you're driving. But I wanted to keep the original power steering box all running, the original setup, straight from the 40. I liked that it had that classic setup. It was already in there. The catch out for me is that I had to move the McKinnon's mount. 
Now we've worked through this with Billy and the great thing is moving forward there should be this option available for anyone going down the same road I am. So McKinnon's mounts will make everything a lot easier. The exhaust system is something you're going to have to look at to comply with engineering and emissions. So you're going to have to run your cat and you're going to have to run a muffler and it has to be below a certain decibel. So the way we've run our exhaust is that we've actually run underneath the barra, flipped it around and we've caught up the original root of the exhaust system. So we've picked up all the original exhaust mounts uh, and just made it so much easier to fit up and make it because we had a bit of template to follow, which is fantastic. The conversion kit from the barra to your transmission. There's two options. One, auto box. I didn't go the auto box, so I can't really comment too much on that but I'm led to believe it's still fairly straightforward and simple, but you're gonna need more wiring, more modification to inside your cab and around your transmission tunnel. On top of that, you're gonna to have to make some more modifications to all your drive shafts. So I opted to go with the five speed. I've gone with the H55F, and we've gone with a Delos adapter. Don't get me wrong, the Delos adapter works really, really well. Bolts up, no issues there. Everything works beautifully. The only issue we had was working around the slave cylinder, so it didn't quite, didn't quite work properly. We ended up fabricating up one just to make it spot on. So just be aware that when you talk to Delos, give them as much information that is correct from the vehicle that you're getting it from and the motor that it's going up to, because that'll make a difference in every single part that fits up to it. The next most crucial part of your build, you cannot do it without it, is the wiring and the ECU. Now, that is like I said before, you need to make sure that you're wiring and your ECU with the motor when you buy it. I highly recommend that you talk to someone that has done these type of conversions before when it comes to wiring and reprogramming your ECU. I went through a guy called Jim at Sideshow Wiring. I tell you what, Jim's not the cheapest, but you cannot put a price on the knowledge and the after sales service that Jim gave me. So I sent all my wiring, the entire wiring loom, ECU, the whole lot down to Jim. He stripped all the wiring loom down, all new plugs, reprogrammed the ECU, full communication with the customer, exactly where your OBD is gonna go or where you want it, where you want your computer to mount up, how far away your accelerator pedal is. Everything is customized and made to length to fit to your specifications. So I opted up for the fuse box to go inside the engine bay. I also opted up for the computer to sit inside my glove box, which is absolutely beautiful. Like I said before, I believe that Ford made their ECU the to fit in a 40 series glove box. It's that perfect. On top of that, when you plug it all in, which is just plug and play, it's as simple as that. Jim gives you a full rundown of exactly where all the wires get to know, and there's really only five wires that you need to put in. It's pretty simple. If I had bought this wiring loom of some random guy at eBay for like 400 bucks, who knows whether it would have worked properly, who knows if the cabling was long enough, and the after sales would have been non-existent. So make sure you talk to your auto electrician, whoever's gonna do your wiring, that they know their stuff, and that you get some confidence in it. You can't put a price on it. While we're still on the topic of electrical wiring, let's talk about the alternator. Now the FG comes with a smart alternator. That's not really ideal for what we're trying to achieve here, as it does all sorts of weird stuff that is way over my head. So we all went for the dumb alternator. Now, direct question, what's a dumb alternator? The dumb alternator is, it basically just takes the charge and puts it straight into your battery. It's as simple as that. It's not trying to regulate anything. It's not trying to change currents. It's not trying to keep up with anything. And it's just two wires and it sticks straight on. So we're talking about an alternator, anything before FG. So from what I understand, you can go way back to AUs, but I just typed in VA alternator, bought it, fit it straight up. Plugs all came from Sideshow Wiring, wired it up, done. Super simple, all the instructions are there. Righto, engine location. As we spoke about before, we use the McKinnon's mounts. Now, realistically, you can put this motor wherever you like. You need to take into a few things into account. One, the reason I've put it into my location is that it bolted straight up to the existing five-speed gearbox. I didn't have to change the cross member. I didn't have to change any of the drive shafts. I didn't have to change any of the stuff underneath on the drive line. 
The only downside of that is it is very close to the firewall to the point where we had to do some serious massaging on the firewall to give us some clearance. Now, there's a few options you can do here. You can move the motor forward, giving you more clearance on the firewall, bring it closer to the radiator. We've got plenty of room here. There's no issues there. But that means you're going to have to possibly move your cross member, your gearbox, and modify both your front and rear drive shafts. In hindsight, to be honest, I probably would have moved it forward and done the extra work just to give myself that bit of extra clearance. But as Billy says, there's a warning there. If you're moving it forward, you have the risk of the sump hitting on your front axle. Right, let's talk heating and cooling. This is obviously a very important part for your motor. Now, we've gone with a brand new radiator, copper cord, we've pulled out the aluminium one, not because there was anything wrong with it, but we've gone with something that's got a little bit more reliability in it and we're starting from scratch because we want to make sure this engine stays cool. Now this is where it starts to get a little bit tricky as far as hosing. Now the beauty is you can buy a swivel thermostat housing that you can put into any location you like. This was a bit of a game changer in trying to fit up hosing or making extra hosing or twisting stuff around. As you can see, it's straight in, made life incredibly easy. The bottom setup, we had to cut two different hoses together to get a nice shape around, to clear it all, and then we've made up a guard just to keep it away from any pulleys, keeping it safe. Heater hoses. Now, Raceworks makes some really cool fittings that just screw straight into all your heater hosing connections, and you just plug your hoses straight on. Now, what we need to do is we need to have the bypass run. And the reason for that is the heater core in the 40 series Land Cruiser, it's old. <laughs> There's a possibility that the pressure of the heater system in this will blow that heater core out and you're gonna have coolant all through your cab. You're gonna be losing coolant. You're gonna, it's not good. Let's just say it's not good. So we need to bypass the heater system. It goes into the side of the block. It gives us a path for the coolant to run. It doesn't overpressurize your heater core and causing any dramas. Righto, now we get to the part where we spend more time than the driver's seat. So the crucial part is your accelerator pedal positioning. You need to make sure that's right. Now, the beauty is McKinnon's, they actually have a solution for that. Again, straight off the shelf, it just bolts straight onto the accelerator pedal and you mount it straight onto the firewall. So it really doesn't get any easier than that. The position, the angle, the geometry, everything, they've done all the homework for us. That was easy, that was an easy solution. The next thing is your setup for your gauging. Now, we need to make sure that you're reading all the information from that motor so you don't get yourself caught out. You wanna make sure you've got your oil pressure, you wanna make sure you've got your temperature, uh, your revs, and then you tie in your speed and your fuel, which are auxiliary items to the barrel motor. OBD will pick up pretty much everything except for oil pressure and your speed. So there's a great option there to be able to get some aftermarket dashes. We're running the NQ dash, which is incredible. It picks up pretty much everything we need to do. Now, the oil pressure, all we needed to do there was run a T-piece, oil pressure gauge from an AU Falcon, and the sender wire straight into the dash. So that was a really quick, easy solution for that. If you're gonna run a homemade dash or a different sort of setup, you need to be aware that a GPS only speedometer unfortunately will not pass engineering well it, it, i know that for new south wales i assume it's the rest for australia the rest of the world i think you guys can do whatever you like so you're a lot more lenient so that's crucial information for the barra now what's left in the 40 series that's redundant we've got our idle up switch choke obviously another one that's gone so you're going to give yourself a few options that you can reuse uh, different locations which is pretty cool. Again, the rest of it's pretty much the same. And as I said before, ECU in the glove box, it's well protected, great spot for it. Righto, so that is the Barra conversion in a nutshell. So if you guys are doing a Barra conversion, hopefully this has been a help to you. And if you're doing other engine conversions, hopefully there's been some little tips and tricks in there to get you sorted as well. And I'll tell you why I really, really like this Barra. One, pulled out a straight six, four litre. I put back in a straight six, four litre.
As you can see, the barrow's in. Woo! Increasing it by 100 kilowatts to what it was. It's 195 kilowatts as it sits. That's more than enough. A lot more than the two F ever produced, so nearly double, which is pretty, pretty cool. All the weights have pretty much stayed the same, so it doesn't mean you're changing any of your suspension setup. It is such a great option. The barra is reliable, and to be honest, I'm not a Ford guy, but I'm giving this Ford an absolute wrap. Still reliable, it'll still get me anywhere, but comfort on the road. Hopefully fuel economy is gonna be dropped a fair bit. From all reports, it's supposed to be pretty good. I can't report on that just yet, I haven't done enough. So now all it is is up to your imagination. Bull bars, driving lights, suspension, lifts, tires, rims, roof racks, whatever it is, make sure you get it all done before you take it to engineering because all of that will go into your certificate and it'll all comply and make it legal. Righto guys, like I said, that's it. Hopefully it's been a help to you guys and until next time, take care of yourselves.